everybody. Welcome back to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. My name is Scott Miller, and I'm privileged each week to serve as your host and interviewer. Today, I am honored, excited, enthused to have Dave Hollis, who serves as the current COO of The Hollis Company and the author of the new book, Launch Today, Get Out of Your Own Way, A Skeptic's Guide to Growth and Fulfillment. Dave Hollis, welcome to On Leadership. Oh, Scott Miller, it's so good to have uh, time with you on your show. Thanks for having me. Hey, Dave, man, it's been great to know you. Uh, obviously, you are the lesser known, I'm kidding, uh, spouse of your wife, uh, Rachel Hollis, who has authored some amazing books the last couple of years, right? Girl, Wash Your Face, Girl, Stop Apologizing. Together, the two of you are raising three young adults or four young adults. You are launching this global brand. You're changing the lives of countless millions through your organization. I'm excited to have you here today to launch your book. I got a pre-press copy a few uh, weeks ago. The actual book is, um, I believe, hardcover. Is that right? Not soft cover. It is. It I is. have devoured this book. I have so many notes in it. Honored that you would take time out of your launch schedule from around the, the nation this week to join us on leadership. Uh, this book is going to light the country on fire. I mean, for all of you women out there that fell in love with Girl, Wash Your Face or Girl, Stop Apologizing, this is a very similar tome for men, recognizing that I think women will enjoy it just as much as men enjoyed your wife's book. Dave, I want to get into your book, but first I want you to take our audience on a bit of a journey, kind of where you've been uh, professionally, your family, and what landed you at the Hollis Company a couple of years ago. Right on. So, my wife and I, as you say, are working at the Hollis Company. We have been doing so in Austin, Texas for the last two years. But prior to that, I had a 20 or so year time in the entertainment business. I started at Fox inside of international research, went to publicity, jumped over into some grassroots marketing, a talent agency, and finished my entertainment career with a 17 year journey at the Walt Disney Company during which time I worked inside of the movie studio the last seven of those 17 years, working as the head of sales for our distribution, our film studio. And so uh, I had the benefit during that time of working with some of the greatest storytellers on earth and uh, some of the most prolific brands. I happened to have come into my job just as Pixar was acquired by the Walt Disney Company, followed then quickly by Marvel Studios and then Lucasfilm. And so my job selling movies to movie theaters was an amazing one, an incredible one, but ultimately one that was met with me having a learning curve that as it came down, uh, the leverage in having the greatest slate in the history of time made some of the things that were exciting about it a little bit easier to do. Uh, really a testament to the strength of the team that was surrounding me and these amazing brands that Bob Iger had brought into the family of films at the Walt Disney Company. So this, this feeling, this getting straight A grades on tests for not having to study, was really putting me into a position of feeling a little stuck. I wasn't really growing. And at the same time, my wife had spent about 15 years of time building a business that was at a tipping point, where she, as the creative and the visionary for what she wanted to do and putting tools in people's hands, found herself really needing an operator, an integrator to help take her business to the next level. We had a series of conversations about doing something that most people frankly don't, leaving uh, my job as the president of distribution to go pursue our dreams together. And here we are two years later in Austin with a team when we moved of four, now at 65, and really hopefully having a, a lot of impact on the people who interact with us in community every day. I mean, Dave, you, you didn't do that whole story justice because you're humble. But I mean, I want the audience to, to feel and appreciate the fact that, I mean, you left at the pinnacle of your career in the most iconic brand in the world. You left the security, the, uh, the uh, excitement, the influence from that role to join your wife's firm with a couple of employees on an unyet proven brand that in 18 months has become uh, really, I mean, just words escape me on the, on the trajectory of the Hollis brand. What was it like to leave the security and the prestige and the comfort and the economic stability of that role and join your wife's firm? It was hard. I, I'm not going to lie. Uh, there were so many things at the time that I was connected to, whether they were limiting beliefs or uh, insecurity about what 
Other people might think of me making this decision that made sense to us, but not to them. The like idea of even leaving something inside of security and predictability, which for me, certainty was a commodity that, man, I had chased more than almost anything for the majority of my life. And it took me confronting this reality that I was stuck in this weird threshold between 30 and 40, as I was asking a better, bigger set of existential questions about why I was on this planet and what the heck I was doing in a position that wasn't fully utilizing all of my potential, that I had to ask if maybe getting outside of my comfort zone and pursuing something that was actually going to put me in a position to fail. I mean, I was in working at the greatest media company on earth, at the Walt Disney Company, with the greatest and strongest team and the best films ever. Uh, I was really in a position where I couldn't fail. And that was less a suggestion of my, you know, being great at my job and more a suggestion that, man, the surroundings just put their thumb on the scale in a way that really tilted it in my favor. And this decision to go do this work with my wife, as much as failing isn't something that I am actively interested in or even enjoy, the fact that I can is the thing that will afford me growth. And so as I'm, you know, like wrestling with these bigger existential things, I knew that the answer was I needed to go and pursue something that would test me and try me, uh, that would push me outside of my harbor of safety. And, uh, and I've done it. And I'll tell you, I thought that the hardest thing was the decision to leave. It was just the beginning of a series of hard decisions. It was yeah. hard to deal with the identity shift of being the primary breadwinner, of having a title that meant something from a company that meant something, that um, you know had us chasing something that introduced failure at such a regular clip where those failures absolutely 100% have been for the way that we're building and growing this team. But during the beginning, I'll be honest, I saw the failure as a somewhat an indictment on me, maybe not being the kind of leader that this organization needed because I was coming out of an organization that didn't have failure happen on such a regular basis. All right. Dave, other than your charisma, good looks, cash in the bank, and eloquence, we have some things in common. And that is that I wrote a book, as you know, called Management Mess to Leadership Success, where I sort of um, uh, uncharacteristically for our brand shared a lot of my own messy journey in leadership. It's a very similar genre of writing in your own book. You know, get out of your own way. You share in raw, relatable, real detail a lot of challenges that you have faced, brought on yourself, decisions you made that you had to recover from. You share an early one about being the high school valedictorian. I love this story because it just shows the willingness you are at age 45 to offer to the world your own struggles and to make it easier for everybody else. Will you share what the story and the insight was from you being or not being the high school valedictorian? Oh yeah, so it's it's interesting because I, in this chapter, each of the chapters is a lie that I once believed that in uncovering the truth makes that lie, that limiting belief, unbelievable. And the lie here was that I did something wrong, so I am something wrong. And here is a person who had pursued achievements and recognition from that achievement for all of my life through my first 18 years. I, as the valedictorian and the speaker on the day of graduation, had uh, come to that place with also some of my humor, a thing that can at times be a defense mechanism as a part and parcel of who I am. And so in the preparation for the delivery of this speech that has still to this day not been heard, spoiler alert, <laughs> I was pulled aside by a few of the administrators of the school and warned about how I needed to stick to my speech, how I could not extemporaneously throw things in or use my humor, that this was serious. And the morning of the speech, as we were getting ready to rehearse one last time, when the principal came and reiterated a thing that had been reiterated quite a bit, I snapped. And I flipped them off and I stormed off and used every word in the book and was suspended from my last day of school. And as a person who had really assigned achievement and every adornment that was on my robe and the way I was a part of certain societies that like that was a, an it, it equated to my value. The fact that now I wasn't able to participate, that I wasn't going to be the speaker, that I brought shame to myself and my family really was a thing that I thought, I mean, at the time, I thought I would wake up every day for the rest of my life 
that being the first thing I thought of, that being the last thing I thought of when I went to sleep. And really, it took me understanding that, of course, there's humanity in all of us. We all make mistakes. I made one, learn from it. And what I learned in like the hubris at the time, I couldn't see it was that this administrator deserved the respect that he was afforded. And even his bringing up to me that I needed to take it seriously was something that I should have taken seriously. I didn't need to react the way I did. But uh, anyway, I, I mean, I tell the story because you have inevitably, as a listener, made mistakes. But choosing to stay connected to that mistake and indicting yourself forever as being wrong or broken or whatever it might be uh, is just a story that you're telling yourself. You need to take the learnings from it and become stronger because of it, not chained down to whatever it is that you did. Dave, the tagline of the book is A Skeptic's Guide to Growth and Fulfillment. You've had an amazing career. Yeah, by all uh, confession, your marriage, like all of ours, has been up and down. You have four children. Pressures in life are extreme. You don't talk explicitly about the role that therapy has played in your life in the book. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of different places. Uh, what advice would you give to our listeners and viewers that might be struggling with their own growth, their own habits, their own challenges in terms of the role therapy played for you and might play for them? Oh, I am such an advocate of therapy. Uh, if you take anything away from this, I hope that you in some way feel permission if today you don't think it a thing that should or be uh, in any way is available to you. Uh, for me, therapy was an important first step because as I was stuck, as I was getting in my own way, I, as I was doing things that today I am proud for having overcome, but at the time didn't have pride for, I needed to go and sit on the couch of an objective human being to unpack why I was doing the things I was doing, why I believed the things that I did, why the capital T truths of my life were the things that I believed. And in sitting in that room, in you know verbally processing some of the things that were sitting in the background of my unconscious, I was able to get a bit of an answer key, a trail of breadcrumbs that in following, I was able now to understand why I did the things I do so that I could not do the things I don't like to do. Uh, if I hadn't had therapy as a thing that could help step me through a little bit of that why, I wouldn't have had the way out of a place that had me completely and totally stuck. I cannot, absolutely cannot recommend therapy enough. Dave, any advice you might give also on how to choose the right therapist? I mean, where did, if someone says, okay, I got it, I know I need a therapist. I kind of don't know where to start, even how to find one. I mean, you're not a physician or a therapist referral service, but what did you learn about finding the right mix and how? what's this person's first step? Well, I mean, the first thing that I did was find people in my circle that I yeah. trusted to just share a little bit of what I was going through and what I needed and inevitably found through that just sharing, hey, I struggle a little bit in this. Uh, my struggle feels like it may be universal. Anybody else uh, struggling in this? Oh, you are? You find out that there is absolute universalness to this thing of struggle. But in that, I found a friend in my circle who said, hey, I actually have been seeing this person. You ought to go and see this person. Yeah. And uh, I went and uh, did it like you would a job that you're interviewing for. I interviewed this person uh, to see if there was a fit. And uh, luckily for me, there was the first time, but in having had many now conversations with people as they're processing their own trauma, as they're processing their own struggle or their interest in, you know, just trying to get some answers as to why they do what they do. My best recommendation is to look and see like, like a Yelp, you can find ratings for therapists online right now, yeah. go and do an interview. Uh, if, if someone is good, they will offer you the opportunity to ask them questions about the kind of services they provide. You'll get a vibe for who they are over a quick phone conversation and then sit with them. And if it feels like a fit, fantastic. If it doesn't feel like a fit, you can find someone else. Uh, if you have never been to therapy, I will say this, the beginning will feel wonky. Like it's going to feel strange. It'll feel weird. And a little bit of it is you have to just kind of push through the beginning resistance that you have to something that, that's new and different until it becomes something that you're looking forward to and flows. 
David, it's gracious of you to kind of put those breadcrumbs down, as you said. I mentioned earlier the book is raw, but it's also riotously funny. One of my favorite parts of it is early on on page eight, where you talk about the, the debrief you got at, I think, one of your roles at Disney, where you had just been prattling on as a know-it-all in a meeting, and finally your leader says something quite choice to you in the book that I'll let you say to whatever extent you want. Kind of recreate that scenario for us, and what did you learn from that? Yeah, you know, early on in my career, I definitely went through uh, some early promotions faster than some that had me triggered, like I think many people can be, with a bit of a feeling of imposter syndrome. I was sitting in a role that was, uh, because of its accelerated nature, putting me in rooms with people that I thought for sure were judging me as being capable for the title that I'd been handed. <laughs> and so now, every time I found myself in a room, no matter the topic, when a silence would fall the room, I decided to insert every smart piece of information that I could to justify the worthiness of me sitting in the room. And that smart piece of content may in fact have had nothing to do with the agenda of the day's conversation. And at the end of one of these moments, uh, I was asked by my boss if I might follow him to his office and I, yep, I'm imagining in real time that I'm gonna go in for, uh, whether it's one five or two, a statue of some kind being you know, created in me like memory of the fact that I've contributed beyond the call of duty inside of a meeting. Mr. Dave Hollis, please take this award and the door closes and he says, shut the F up. Except he didn't uh, you know, just keep it at F, he pierced me right in my baby's soul. But he more or less said this, look, if we didn't think that you could handle this job, I wouldn't have put you in it. I have confidence in your ability to do this job and your worry of what other people think of you doing this job, triggering you to try and justify your worthiness is actually working against the thing you are trying to do. You are, you are actually stopping people from believing that you should have this job. Quit sabotaging yourself. Trust that you are in this job because you can do it and get out of your own way. And it was, I mean, man, this was three years into my working at Disney and it was one of the most important lessons I could have ever been given. And the delivery, honestly, as much as man, it hurt to hear, it was exactly the kind of delivery I needed to have it stick with me all these years later. Dave, I was delighted that you shared that story because I've had a very similar experience in my job here. 24 years at the Franklin Covey Company. I worked at Disney, you know, four years prior to coming here. I know the Disney culture very, uh, is very different than this. We have a very conservative uh, culture here. A couple of years ago, the CEO that I work for, a man of impeccable integrity, uh, takes me aside after a meeting. And it's literally the only advice he's given me in my two decades here. I get feedback occasionally. But he pulls me aside, very similar to your just story, and says, Scott, you make too many declarative statements. That was it. <laughs> and it, it was, you know, it was the same as kind of the F word in the Franklin Covey culture, but it was profound. And it also reminds me of the story of a mutual friend of ours, Kim Scott, who wrote Radical um, Candor, right? She shares this life-changing lesson where Sheryl Sandberg, who was her boss back in the Google days, pulled her aside after a meeting with the then, I think, CEO and COO and said, how do you think that went? And Kim Scott says, well, I think it went really well. I was really proud. And Cheryl said, no, it was horrible. Your hands were all over the place. You were saying um and uh and like and you know. If you want your brand to be a person of persuasion and confidence, you've got to tighten up the professional way in which you speak. And uh, Cheryl kind of took her to task. And Kim Scott in her book and on my interview here talked about how powerful that was as a transition figure in her own role. I share all of that to ask you, how did that intervention at Disney instruct the way you lead the members of your team now in the Hollis company? Oh, I mean, it's so profoundly. And it's interesting because Kim Scott and whether it's her book or the videos that she has online, like those have been teaching tools inside of the teams that I've led for the entirety of my leadership journey. And as much as it's definitely something that I had employed at the Walt Disney Company and something that after I was teaching it at the Disney Company became something that Rachel was teaching at the company that existed before the Hollis Company, Chic Media. When we started working together, I'll tell you, we had to ourselves employ radical candor 
between us as business partners yeah. in a way that was a departure from the way that we had historically been what I would call a little more codependent and not wanting to really have to tackle hard stuff, not want to bring things up that could maybe upset one of us or throw our mood off. Um, because here we come from working in separate spaces and are now spending a lot of time together. But in doing that are, you know, running into problems on like the quarter hour. Like I wish that I could tell you that, man, we figured out how to not have problems here, but we have not figured out how to not have problems here. We have them all the time. We just have found that through radical candor, we can talk about them faster with less emotion because of all of the things that are in Kim's work. Like we have a care for addressing things quickly because of our respect for each other. And, you know, for us as a couple, I'll tell you, that was really hard at the beginning, but now the frequency of how often we have to have very direct, in your words, courageous conversations uh, has taken a lot of the sting out of it and is now what we have to do to be responsible to the 65 people here that depend on us working well and responsible to the relationship that we want to maintain after we get done working at the end of each day. Hey, Dave, let's transition to some more of the book. You know, for those who may not be aware of the Hollis Company yet, uh, you and your wife together and your team of 65 will sell millions of copies of your collective books this year. You will have live events around the world, right? London and Toronto and Fort Myers and Charleston and Austin, where literally tens of thousands of people will show up for a three-day life-changing experience. Both you and your wife have online personal professional coaching sessions. I mean, the impact on the brand that you're building is significant, but this hasn't happened overnight because your wife toiled as uh, an author and a blogger for you know, 15 plus years and you built a 20 year corporate career. And you came in as the CEO of what was essentially your wife's company. You own it together, obviously. And in the book, you share word for word, I'm assuming an email that your wife sent you early on when you joined the company as the CEO after stepping down from Disney. I won't read the whole thing, but I wanna read a paragraph. And I want you to ask me, what were you feeling when you read it? Why did you include it in the book? And what hope did you, um, what, what help did you think it would offer the reader? I'm gonna read this paragraph. This is what Rachel Hollis sends to you in an email. This is midway through. You tell me, I need to tell you what I want you to do. You've been saying that ever since we made the decision to join forces. But my frustration comes because I shouldn't have to tell you the problems we have at work. Don't you get that? Your team shouldn't have to tell you the problems. You should be so in the business that you know our weaknesses and we can work on the strategy to make us stronger. That's my frustration. You're not in the business. You're floating above it. A CEO can and should work from 50,000 feet, but not with a business, a team, and an industry this new. Talk a bit about your feeling, why you included it, what you want the learning to be from that. Well, I mean, my immediate feeling when I read that was uh, like shot to the heart. I mean, it pierced my soul kind of feeling. Um, but one of the superpowers that I think we have in our relationship and that she certainly has as my accountability partner is the permission and the ability to very clearly articulate the areas where I can step up and get out of my own way. And I included it. I included it in a chapter where the lie was, what got me here will get me there. Uh, because I made the mistake of believing that the 20 plus years of entertainment experience that I had in primarily, in primarily conglomerate big company environments would serve me perfectly as the now head of this small upstart business that we were gonna go work on together. And so much of the muscle memory of the 10 previous years, forget the 20, but just even in the 10 previous years where I was the leader of big teams, where each of those teams to a person had leaders on them that almost exclusively had more experience than I did at the discipline they were managing had me with the benefit of people who were just so good and so tenured in their work that the role that I played for them as a leader was completely different than the kind of role that I have to play as a leader here inside of this small business. And she, as a person who'd been an entrepreneur for 15 years, who'd been toiling and working and modifying and failing and fixing 
her business for 15 years knew a thing that I could not have possibly known, even if I'd been as close an observer of her work for that decade and a half, that you have to roll your sleeves up, get your nails dirty in a way that was a departure from the idealized version of what a CEO does in the corporate conglomerate environment that I'd come out of. And I included it because inevitably pivot happens, right? You are going to find yourself one day in one season having a certain identity and then it will change. And sometimes it's a change that you'll choose. And oftentimes it'll be a change that chooses you. And when you get in that new season where you're assuming a new identity, playing a new role, if you think the things that absolutely 100% worked last time are just like plug and play going to work going forward, I hate to tell you, you're wrong. And my being wrong, like the fact that it hurt my feelings to have to like face this didn't change the fact that I was wrong. I was wrong. I was wrong to have thought the things I did and the generosity of my wife being exceptionally clear helped me find ways to address the things that I wasn't doing for my team. I was still contributing some fantastic value, don't get me wrong, but I wasn't doing some of the things they needed most when it came to leading them on the day to day. And here's the thing too, I mean like this is a little bit of the Kim Scott and us come to a even further place. We've committed as a couple and as business partners that sometimes our courageous conversation, sometimes our radical candor has to take place in the form of email because I am a little more of a debater. She's a little more of a thinker and I can pretty quickly shut her down in a way that ends up actually having me show up as a bully. Yeah. It's like the worst version of myself. And so we agreed, hey, if there's a, dis if there's a you know, discrepancy or a, or a disagreement of some kind in our approaching the business or in our relationship that you feel like may have me using one of my superpowers as a super weakness and start debating and cutting you off or any of the, then let's put it on paper. So this as a vehicle for us allows each of us to read the entirety of the thought, sit with it, even as it hurts, and then process a, a reaction that can a little more objectively meet the person where they can hear the reaction that isn't so wrapped in emotion. And so part of why I wanted to include it was also to model there is a way for you to have hard conversations, even if you're a person that doesn't necessarily excel at the talking in the conversation, you can still have great communication through other form, like writing a note. I read the, those thoughts in the book and thought, I see a lot of myself in you with my own spouse, right? A very competent, well-educated stay-at-home mom by our mutual choice. But like that, I can use my debate skills to bully her I don't think I had those words around it until I read that chapter. The book's been profoundly helpful to me. Chapter three, The Lie. I have it all together. I, I think this is, in essence, an awkward term, but the value proposition for your book on page 30. No one has it all together. And the people who are willing to admit that freely, who are willing to admit that first, will disarm and connect with the people they care about most in life. There are many things we all universally struggle with, and when someone acknowledges it, we can't help but to, to be drawn to them. You know, like you, Dave, I think I also, when I kind of hit my late 40s, used vulnerability as my strength. I call it hanging a lantern on your problem, right? I mean, yes, I have a short attention span. Yes, I have a stutterer. Yes, I have imposter syndrome. Yes, I'm overly passionate about everything in life and find it difficult to focus. I think similarly, you've written this whole book around using your struggles and your willingness to be vulnerable to help other people. Was that tough? Have you thought about the downside of that with your own brand and your own career? So what's interesting is I'll even go back further. Like right? we made this choice to do this work together in part because of me getting a first draft copy of Girl, Wash Your Face. Right. Which, if you're unfamiliar, was my wife's big breakthrough book. It wasn't her first book, but certainly the one that made the biggest uh, mark so far. And in it, she's sharing a ton of super vulnerable stories. And when I read it the first time, I did my very best to talk her out of publishing the book. I thought she was sharing too much, that it would be bad for the brand, that it was dangerous for our relationship or uh, bad for our kids. And I, man, I tried to talk her out of it. Now, guess what? The book sold 4 million copies. It's unbelievable in such a short amount of time. But more than the number of copies it sold, 
the letters, the, the emails, the comments that I've seen in social media of people recognizing that in having seen their own story in her stories and having seen some of the tools that she applied to some of the problems that she had, they were able to have breakthroughs. They were able to believe differently in what was possible for their life. And in that, in like my witness of that, I completely changed the way I thought about vulnerability and had to ask the question. At the time, I had zero interest in writing a book. I was trying to talk her out of writing a book. But as I was really trying to answer those big existential questions of how to best use the potential inside of myself, this notion of impact truly was the thing that kept on you know, coming up as the North Star. And I had to ask, hey, could sharing my stories, the stories of my struggle, because of struggle being as universal as it is, if you're listening to this, you struggle, guess what, so do I, we have that like the rest of humanity in common. If I can share this, and you can see some of you in my story, whether you're a woman or a man, right. whether you're old or young, working at home or working out of the house, is there the possibility in my vulnerability to make you feel less alone? And in you feeling less alone, maybe also you know, seeking a little bit of some of what I may have used to get out of my own way as a possible route for you to get out of yours. And I mean, as a part of like our broader business, even beyond this book, we have, with whether it's our podcast or the morning show or these live events, like our vulnerability and willingness to just acknowledge, man, there is struggle in every day, but here's how we're working and progressing through it. It's part of what's connecting us to the audience because everybody struggles and it's okay to admit it. I think there's, for me, there has been so much strength in owning the story of my struggle yeah. in a way that cannot in any way confine me or hold me back any longer. I am not proud necessarily of every single thing I did that I've chronicled in this book, <laughs> but the pride that I have for owning my journey and the way that I'm now a victor on having overcome the things that I've talked about, forget it. I am free. And that, if there's anything out there for anyone, you will find freedom in owning your struggle in a way that keeping it in the dark will never allow you. Own your mess, baby. Own your mess. Uh, the book is Get Out of Your Own Way. The sixth lie is everyone is thinking about what I'm doing. I love the fact also at the end of each chapter, similar to your wife's book and in my books that I write, you get some great kind of end of chapter thoughts, right? Some, quick, some takeaways. Think about this. In this chapter, I like the fact you call it um, things that helped me. I took emotion out of the equation. My wife is a master at isolating what is real and what is imagined as it pertains to other people's opinions. The emotional side of us all will contrive a version of events that, when the more objective part of us steps in, often proves to be not true. The more I was able to objectively stand outside of emotion and ask if there was a chance my feelings were fueled by insecurity, and not reality, the easier it was to brush aside that worry. Send us off, Dave, with the liberating power of kind of differentiating between facts and emotions and not being so consumed with what other people are or aren't thinking about you. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll tell you this. Let's start with this gift. No one is thinking about you. Right. <laughs> I mean, it, like, I hate to pierce your soul on this one because, man, our ego and the vanity of life has us really clinging to this idea that everyone's paying attention to what we're doing. But I, I, I will tell you, no one is thinking about you. And I say this having given a lot of weight to what other people would think of me making a decision that very few people make and leaving a job like I did for the one that I have. And when I left, realizing that as much as they are good people, and it's not an indictment on them in any way, it is a recognition of their humanity. They were, like you are, thinking of themselves. So that's the first thing. Two, that there, there are some, you know, small percentage of people, I'd say like 85% of people just not thinking about you, 10% of people, they are thinking about you, but their thinking about you is coming through the lens of their fear and not your truth. So while you're being, you know, you may worry about being judged, you might be being judged, but it's not for what you're doing, it's how what you're doing is shining a light on what they're not doing, right? It's not, you know, like that they're um, truly afraid for you, they're afraid for themselves. Get rid of those 10%. You're left with 5% of the people that you have in your life that may actually still be thinking about you. And those people, though they may have concern, may be concerned because they don't understand your why. They don't understand the reasoning behind. They don't understand the values that you hold. They right. 
And so if you can find a way to intellectually, objectively cut through who in your life you've given weight to, you find that 95% of the people that you have afforded some opinion in your life is unwarranted. It is not something that serves you. Their credibility as a witness to whether you're doing the right or wrong thing is not deserved. And the last 5% that are, maybe just don't necessarily have enough information to totally understand it. But in any case, every single time that you get caught up in what other, someone else is thinking or what they're worrying about, you are giving away your power to the fear of someone else. Don't do that. Dave Hall is so well said. Your book is on fire right now with pre-sales out this week. Get out of your own way, a skeptic's guide to growth and fulfillment. Dave, as we sign off, talk a little bit about some of the, the mission and the purpose of the Hollis Company. Talk a little bit about your coaching and perhaps the Rise, Rise business events that people want to hear more about uh, from you and your wife. How can they connect with you? Right on. Thanks, Scott. So we uh, have a website. It's thehollisco.com where all of the information of our company exists. We are here truly to put tools into people's hands to help them reach for a more exceptional version of their life. We do that through these books. We do it through our live events. There's a three-day women's conference called Rise. There's a three-day business conference called Rise Business. We've just announced a run that we're doing in December called Rise Run. We do have digital education products. There uh, is a life coaching and a career coaching track that is uh, happening this year for me. Uh, we have podcasts and Rise and Rise Together. And we do a fun morning show every morning called the Start Today Morning Show on Facebook and Instagram. We live a strange life, but we're having some fun. I don't know if I'm embarrassed or proud to admit that I'm so addicted to your morning Facebook Live program. I have my phone propped up in my bathroom as I'm shaving. The problem is I can't hear it when I'm shaving. So I have to like watch the program. I'm, I'm texting or emailing you half the time about how much I'm enjoying it. It's a great way to send off everybody to kind of work in their day in the morning. It's a gift you and your wife give um, all of us that are subscribing and listening. Dave, thanks for your time. You don't need it. But best of success this week as you're out across the nation. How many events are you doing for your book? I have 21 book tour. I mean, at this point, 21. Who knows how many we're going to do? But I got 21 on the calendar. I am ready to go. Hey, I got some street cred when it comes to books. And to all of those of you who are listening, I've read all these books back here. This book, Get Out of Your Own Way by Dave Hollis, launched this week, is going to earn a place of fame on the wall behind me. Dave, thank you for taking time out of your book launch schedule to join us. Look forward to collaborating in the future. Thank you, Scott. I so appreciate you giving me this opportunity. And thank you to the audience for listening. I hope it was uh, helpful in any way. My audience, I tell you, it's a great book. Buy it for your father, your husband, your brother. But it's also like Rachel's books. I thoroughly enjoyed Girl, Wash Your Face, Girl, Stop Apologizing. My wife and I have been like passing it back and forth in bed the last two weeks because that's how great it is. We appreciate you joining. If you're not subscribing to On Leadership, visit franklincovey.com. Click on the On Leadership button, subscribe, rate it, rank it, review it on all your favorite podcast channels. And we'll see you back here next week with a new guest for On Leadership. Leadership.